Well, welcome everyone. Uh, I am really delighted to be in conversation with Hannah. Um, we uh, seemingly come from extremely different angles, so I obviously represent the physical, concrete uh, uh, world that kind of doesn't move. Uh, and Hannah um, comes from, um, uh, she's also, of course, uh, an artist, uh, a designer, uh, a very creative person, but uh, coming to it from uh, the soft uh, and uh, the kind of, if you like, the ephemeral uh, side of design, but more lately being very interested and actively looking at how to integrate the two. So uh, as, as buildings, actually, uh, the building's future will very much be about how to integrate uh, new kinds of technologies. I'm really delighted to be here, to meet her, and uh, to have the opportunity to have this conversation. Uh, Hannah, um, as uh, well it was on, 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 on the board here, she is the, the, the lead designer at Google Creative Lab, uh, but she has a very interesting uh, route to get there, uh, which I found out only when I, I started looking at her biography. Uh, she uh, you know, studied uh, art and design, um, and then she went on to study communication and she's also worked in advertising. So it, it really uh, brings different uh, scales of design and, and uh, output uh, together in a very, very interesting way. Uh, given her role at uh, Google Creative Lab, I thought we could structure a discussion uh, perhaps around three topic, main topics. And of course, there is, that's just a vague structure and we agreed that we'll just take it wherever our conversation uh, takes it. Uh, perhaps we could talk about technology, um, creativity, and gender. So that's that's kind of um, the more or less the vague direction. So I'd like to start by asking uh, Hannah to tell us a little bit, very briefly, what Google Creative Lab is about. Sure. Thanks for the very kind, very generous <laughs> introduction. Um, so Creative Lab is a small team at Google. We have a team here in London, we have a team in New York, and we have a team in Sydney. And we are tasked with, as a team, reimagining communications across all of Google's various products and all of Google's programs. So on the one hand, that means working with um, product teams and marketing managers on our existing products, so anything from the search engine to Google Maps to Google Translate or YouTube, but also hardware offerings like the Google Pixel phone, which came out uh, this past week, um, or even self-driving cars. But on the other hand of the spectrum, we're also tasked with coming up with what we call innovation projects, which are maybe a little bit more experimental in nature. So. Uh, those could come from anywhere. They could come from within the lab itself. Someone in, on the team has an idea for, for a project they want to do. Um, or it could come from in, in collaboration with an external partner or an internal partner. But, uh, but yeah, there's not a single project I could point to as like, this is, this is a shining example of what Google Creative Lab is all about. I think the best way to get to know the lab is to look at a, a broad range of the things that we do. Because even though everything comes out <clears throat> a bit differently. It might be a film, it might be an installation or, or a product. There is an underlying philosophy or a spirit that kind of ties all the projects together. Um, and I think the, there's one phrase that we throw around quite a lot in the lab that I come back to often, which uh, reads, know the user, know the magic, and connect the two which is quite simple, but when it's done well, it's actually very powerful, I think. And um, yeah, basically everything that we do is with the aim of inspiring people to use our technology to go on and create something great. I think it becomes um, maybe more tangible when we look at a couple yeah. of projects. So yeah. um, I am very excited about Project Jacquard, um, which is you know, just it gives us just a little bit of a flavor of how we're going to see the integration of you know technology in the world of the physical and the kind of transformation that it can make of, of all the physical things, all the objects and things that are around us. Could you tell us about uh, about Project Jacquard? Yeah, sure. So um, Project Jacquard. Well, I'll give I'll give a little bit of background on the project. So there's a uh, there's a team at Google based in Mountain View in California 
called Google ATAP. And ATAP stands for, let me get this right, it stands for the Advanced Technologies and Projects Group. Um, and they developed this amazing technology, basically uh, a way to weave interactivity into any textile using these microscopic uh, threads, these metallic alloy threads that you can weave into any material. So it could be woven into <clears throat> cotton, it could be woven into wool, denim, anything. Um, and basically, if you weave them into a particular grid formation, and you sync them up with some, some electronics, they become touchpads much similar to the screens on your phones. So you could swipe, you could tap, you could hold, um, and those gestures would send instructions to um, any connected device. So the cool, the cool thing about the thread is that it looks and it feels identical to any thread that you would be familiar with today, which means that we can create some really discrete looking uh, connected objects um, and the other important thing to mention is that the, this thread can be manufactured and used on any industrial looms that exist out in the world today. So to create a connected garment using Jacquard, you don't have to interrupt the um, manufacture process as it exists, which means it's, it's quite cost effective. So when ATAP approached Creative Lab, um, they had kind of a, a quite rough prototype of this thing. And what they needed help with was primarily was uh, naming the technology, branding it, positioning it in a market, helping them come up with interesting use cases and applications for it. Um, and this is actually like a very, very early prototype. It's a lot sexier looking now than it is there. But we, we kind of helped them actually refine the, the early prototypes as well. So, so we did that. Um, and that's where the name Jacquard came to be. Uh, with this line technology woven in, which I think does a good job of kind of describing how this thing can be really, really seamless. Um, so I have a short film, it's just three minutes long, which I can play, which gives a little bit more background, I think. Yeah, I think hopefully grounds, grounds this a little bit more, so I'll play that now. What I find fascinating about textiles is the structure of textiles. It's the same to the structure of touch screens, which we're using in everyday mobile devices and tablets. That means that if you just replace some of the threads in textiles with conductive threads, you should be able to weave the textile, which can recognize a variety of simple touch gestures, just like any normal touch panel you have in a mobile phone. So if you can hide or weave interactivity and input devices into the materials, that will be the first step to making computers and computing invisibly integrated into the objects and materials and, and clothing. So this is, is, is exciting to me. The challenge of creating Jacquard yarn was to create yarn that is highly conductive and at the same time scalable, which means it could be used on industrial weaving machines everywhere in the world. For textile designers or fashion designers or furniture designers, it is interesting because it's something you are very familiar with. It's just textile. We made the yarn very thin and feels so natural, so it looks like just normal yarn. The only thing that's different is it's conductive. We work with textile designers from all over the world, and it's really interesting to see what kind of possibilities that we can have. Could be visible, very obviously, like it's here. It also can be totally invisible. So we're creating possibilities by combining different way of weaving technique, and that's totally up to designers to choose, and it's up to their creativity. We're trying to shrink down all the components down to the size of a button. And ultimately, this will be something that's so small we can embed into the manufacturing process. So the users won't even see it or feel it inside the garment. The idea that Jacquard is an interface that is blended into the clothing that we wear that has an implication in the way that you would use services, products, applications, 
and anything that we do through our devices. It's somehow getting the technology out of the way and making interactions more natural and more seamless. In terms of what the technology can do, it's really up to the user and to the designers, and we expect that users can reconfigure it as much as they want to. Software development and fashion design often don't exist in the same place, so we're hoping to make it very simple for each of those parties to collaborate, and we're hoping to provide both software and hardware knowledge and components to make those collaborations very easy. We like to think that we have these iconic products that haven't changed much, but the world is changing. So I think Jacquard presents a great opportunity for a brand, for design, to open a door to the future. In tailoring, we use methods that have been used and not changed for 200 years. So when something new comes along, it's really exciting. What's amazing about the project is that I don't have to have any knowledge about the electronics and how it works. So let's see what we can create with it. Jacquard is a blank canvas for designers and developers. We are just at the beginning and we are really excited to see what people are going to do with it. Is, that is the magic thread. Um, and uh, so actually just, just earlier this year, we, so we announced the partnership with Levi's, who are our first commercial uh, collaborator with Project Jacquard. Um, and this is the, the jacket that we made. This is called the Levi's Commuter Trucker Jacket, um, which is an existing garment in their range, but now enhanced with, with Jacquard thread. So you can see on, on the left image this patch on the sleeve, which is the jacquard patch, and we, we chose to make it visible in this case so users would know exactly where to interact. Um, and then on the right, you can see there's this, um, on the sleeve again, you can see that little tab there. So that's what all of the electronics got shrunk down to from that previous image. Everything is in there, the Bluetooth connector, the charge, and everything. So this is, this is the jacket, and, and I think what I really like about it is that it, it looks like a denim jacket. It doesn't look like a crazy piece of, of, um, of technology. It's something quite quite discreet, quite familiar, but suddenly now enhanced with this extra layer of functionality. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Jacquard. Yeah, but I think what, what is um, exciting and, and, um, and not only you know, the extra things that it makes a jacket do, but it's going to make us behave differently. You know, I, I was imagining, just looking at this example, of what it's going to be like uh, being on the underground, and people are going to be <laughs> <laughs> being okay. <laughs> We're going to have to kind of learn new codes of to interpret, you know, people's movements uh, in, you know, in, in public spaces, and that's kind of you know, and maybe soon we'll have rules of, you know, what you can, where you can put it, and where you can't put it. So, <laughs> so it's quite quite exciting. Um, Project Blocks um, is another one that uh, kind of intrigued me because you use technology you know, as a way to express ideas that would otherwise not be expressible. Uh, and um, when we architects uh, use you know, computers, uh, different kinds of softwares, um, I think we rarely, uh, we, we use them, we might accidentally generate new ideas through them, but they are ultimately a tool for us. Um, um, and it's almost like our ideas come most of the times before. I mean, right now, you know, the Royal Academy has asked us to uh, work on a VR project, and, you know, we've, we've, ne we've, ne we've never touched VR. And so, uh, you know, it was a struggle of what can we do with VR? Um, do you yourself use let's call it technology, uh, in early phases of these projects? Um, so, mm, there's no, okay. So I think at Creative Lab, we think of technology as just another tool in your 
in your toolbox, in your creative toolbox. The same way as you know, you might have the ability to write, you might have the ability to make music or build things. I think being able to code or to prototype things out of technology is just another way of being mm. creative. Um, so we we wouldn't necessarily use it just because we can, to, you know, yeah. for the sake of it, we would we would use the tools that are most pertinent to whatever the end goal is that we're, we're shooting for. So in some cases, yes, that means using technology in the early phases. Uh, Jackard is an example of that. Without making the prototype work right. and have a proof of concept, you have nothing. So technology was kind of the starting point. Mm. But with Project Blocks, Blocks, which is actually also um, a very technical project in a way, the, the, we, we didn't start with technology at all, actually. The, the earliest prototypes of this project we built out of paper and cardboard and glue and Sharpies. Um, so it was the least high-tech thing you can imagine, but we didn't need any technology to um, investigate our, our idea. So, so the, the idea of the, the background of Project Blocks, for those of you who don't know about it, is um, it's a, a, an experimental project that we made to see if we could create a toy, a physical toy, that would help kids, young kids aged around three to eight years old, learn the fundamentals of, of coding, of computational thinking. Um, and we had this hunch that children of that age learn better with their hands, especially when they're grappling with abstract concepts. Um, you know, we all played with blocks as kids and it helped us figure out addition and it helped us figure out physics. And so uh, we had this, this hunch that maybe it could also help us figure out computational thinking. So to, to get to the, the end result, which looks a lot more high-end, arguably, we actually started with paper and cardboard, um, and that was enough for us to play with kids and investigate our, hypo our hypo hypothesis. Um, so this is this is uh, Project Blocks in its kind of most recent iteration. And basically, what it is is an open source uh, hardware platform that we want to give away to designers and researchers and educators and developers for them to go on and build the next generation of tangible programming toys um, for kids. So there's a lot of those toys out there today, but each of them uses a different backend. Each of them looks different, feels different. You, they're expensive to make. We kind of challenged ourselves to see if we could create something that would be cheap and lightweight and modular so people could, could build on top of it. Um, I have a film, we could play it. I don't know if yeah. People have the appetite to say, okay, I'll play it. <laughs> <laughs> So the goal of Project Blocks is to develop an open hardware platform that provides designers, developers, and researchers everything they need to create tangible programming experiences for kids. One of the big things about teaching kids how to program is that they can express ideas that they wouldn't be able to express otherwise. Young kids, you know, they learn by being social, by being collaborative, by playing with things, by exploring with their hands. Taking what's natural to them and then adding a new skill, uh, such as computing and programming, I think we have the best of, of both worlds. I think if one moves away from the screen and keyboard to coding, it's far easier for young people to work collaboratively, and working collaboratively to solve problems is what happens out in the real world. There's a long history of tangibles for programming. It starts in the 70s with Seymour Papert at MIT, and then there are many others, for example, at TURN, and then Topobo and Tangible Programming Bricks. So one of the cool things about tangible programming is accessibility. You've got the little kids who can't you know, read and write yet, but then you've also got students who have dyslexia who can access coding without having a thousand syntax errors. For the most part, the things that we produce in our group are platforms so that developers can really innovate on the content and the applications. Project Blocks is a research project, and our goal is to create an open hardware platform in which developers, makers, and designers can create hands-on programming experiences for kids. As a first step, we've created a system for tangible programming. And the system consists of three main components, a brain board, baseboards, and pucks. The baseboard works by placing a puck onto it, and pucks can be programmed with different instructions, like turn on or off, move in a direction, or increase amount. 
the board then simply read that box instruction. The brain board provides power and connectivity. And when you connect baseboards to it, it can read their instructions and send them to connected objects like a toy or a tablet. The boards can be rearranged in different ways and wrapped in different forms and materials to create all sorts of physical coding experiences. Like a music maker, where you use physical code to compose music and send it to a wireless speaker. Or a sensor lab, where you use physical code to experiment with sensors around you like detecting a drop in temperature and then switching on a light. Or a coding kit where you use physical code to control toys. Like getting a robot to draw a shape on a piece of paper. You're now enabling every maker out there to come up with their solution to what could be tangible computing. So suddenly, as a teacher, I'm excited because there's a whole world who's going to be developing tools that I could potentially use in my classroom. The ultimate aim of Project Blocks is to give all the work we've done back to the education, research and development community for free to accelerate the field of physical programming for kids. From paper, what? from paper and pen. Yes, and yes, glue. No, exactly. I, at the beginning, certainly looks a little bit like starting an architectural project. <laughs> no, I, I just think uh, looking at these projects um, brings a lot of excitement, you know, uh, to to the world of the physical. And um, when I think of what what things you could do for for just our physical spaces, uh, the kitchen, for example, is. Uh, a kind of a um, idea of space around, you know, cooking, which somehow, um, as we know it so far, uh, was locked down as an idea back in the 1930s around, uh, you know, looking at the movements of a housewife and um, studying, you know, the movement over and over again and perfecting some kind of triangular relationship between the fridge and the sink and um, fridge sink and the uh, uh, oven. And, uh, you know, we've kind of, uh, during all of 20th century and to this date, you know, uh, struggled with the idea of keeping it closed and making it open, you know, open plan, closed. But actually, it's kind of fundamentally the same kitchen. Uh, and, of course, lately we've been hearing about uh, robots, you know, being you know, not even one standing, a kind of a robotic arm um, cooking for us in the kitchen. A robot is much more agile, it's going to move entirely differently and it's going to take very little space. It won't move um, actually across in a triangle. You know, it, it, will, it will completely transform the kitchen. Um, and uh, so I, I, I think, you know, it is, it is for sure uh, going to change our physical environments. Uh, and I look at it optimistically. I think it means that us architects will have new things to think about. Mm -hmm. uh, A, we have to integrate, uh, you know, these machines um, into into buildings, and two, change the way buildings have been so far to adjust to them. And um, but the question then comes, you know, is there is there any problem, or is there a point where we become too reliant on technology? You know, uh, what at, should we should we be concerned? How how fast should this happen? Um, you know, we've seen it with, with kind of just our social behavior towards towards each other with the younger generation, and you know, perhaps they are more you know they 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 write more than speak to each other. Um, uh, well, is this something that you discuss at Google? Yeah, it is actually. It's something we discuss constantly and is front of mind with every every project that we do, even if it's um, you know, even if it's not like the, an innovation project, even if it's us kind of just doing something off of the back of an existing product. We're very at Creative Lab, very conscious of how whatever we put out into the world affects the people that are going to use it um, in the short term, and also kind of it's important to have I think like a mid and a long term perspective on that as well. Um, I think in terms of of, ro of robots, like mm. and robots is it's a tif it's a difficult word because I think as soon as you say it, we picture something in our heads that's like this kind of steel, like R two D two type thing, and 
Um, yep, those exist, they do, and other things exist as well, which have no physical form, but could still be called a robot, you know, sort of artificial intelligence. Um, I share your optimism, I have to say. Like, I'm, I'm aware of the potential pitfalls of it, but I think we stand to gain a lot more than we stand to lose from embracing these things. And I think it's important to remember, I would say two things that I think it's important to, to remember when we think about robots. <laughs> One is um, automation is not new. It's something that's been around for a really, really long time and has been happening with increasing speed since the Industrial Revolution. And we're still here and we're still functioning, arguably not at our best right now as a species, but still, you know, we're, we're still around and kicking and, and doing interesting things. And I think um, it's important to just kind of realize that progress is part of, well, progress is a loaded word, but this kind of like development is a, um, is a natural st state of evolution that we find ourselves in. So I think we should em embrace it and get our hands on it rather than just look at it fearfully from the side because if we're, we're touching it, we can affect it and we can shape it in the way that we think is right as opposed to just um, just, just being afraid. And then the, the second point I would say is that computers or robots or artificial intelligence have particular strengths that humans don't. So. One obvious example is performing a really complex calculation really fast. Like humans are not good at that. On the other hand, human beings are really good at things that robots suck at. So humans are really good at um, reading emotional cues or facial cues or understanding like emotional intelligence or divergent thinking or lateral thinking or free associations. These are things that robots really, you know, they suck at. So we have our, our, our strengths and our weaknesses and I think the the potential is in that in-between space when you combine the two. Um, and part of my job at Google is exactly that, which is to showcase what is possible when you combine technology and creativity. Um, and like I said, I'm optimistic. I actually think we're really just at, at the cusp of, of opening up like a whole new realm of potential uh, applications for machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I, I have a film with me that I brought along that I didn't, I didn't work on, so I can't take credit for it. But my counterparts um, at Creative Lab in, in New York made a short documentary about a high school student called Abu who used, he's, I mean, he's 17, he's, he's, a, he's a, a young person. And he used, um, taught himself how to use machine learning to create um, some early breast cancer detection technology that is going to completely change uh, the medical Field. And I think it's a great example of, of you know, the humans, human intelligence at our best and machine intelligence at our best, achieving something that wasn't, wasn't going to be possible. Um, so I can play it if, if you'd like. My name is Abu. I am a high school student, 17 years old. People learn in different ways. For me, if I see something really cool, I was trying to take it apart and figure out how it works. It's a bit more extreme now because instead of it being hardware, I like to know how algorithms work. My freshman year, I remember Googling machine learning. I had no clue what it meant. That's the really cool thing about the internet is that someone's already doing it, so you can just YouTube it and it's right there. The minute I really saw what machine learning can do, it kind of like hit something within me. This like need to build things to help people. My parents are immigrants from Afghanistan. It's not easy coming in. The only reason we made it through some of the times that we did was because people showed acts of kindness. Seeing that at an early age was enough for me to understand that helping people always comes back to you. Machine learning is this concept that we can train computers to identify patterns in data and then use those patterns to predict off of new data. I have a quick demo. It's just some code that I wrote uh, last night. Miss Roscoe is the first teacher that I actually talked to about machine learning. Abu and I first met his sophomore year. I was his programming one teacher. My students do a computer science fair and they are challenged to find a problem, but they have to use a form of technology to solve that problem. And then it kind of hit me in a way where I could actually genuinely help people. Mammograms are the cheapest 
imaging format there is. It's the most accessible to people all around the world. But one of the biggest problems that we see in breast cancer is misdiagnosis. So I decided that that was gonna be my project, build a system for early detection of breast cancer tumors that's accessible to everyone and that's more accurate. How is I gonna do it? Machine learning. It's not an easy thing to do. Data is not publicly available. And if it is, it's low quality data. It's difficult. I wasn't even sure if I could do it. And I remember just thinking about like, everyone else is building a calendar, like maybe I should do that. But I was like, no, you gotta do this. You need to. He was talking to me about all the cool stuff he was doing and I was telling him not to overdo it. You should just be a kid and worry about kid stuff. The biggest, most extensive resource that I've used is this platform called TensorFlow. I've spent so many hours going really deep into these open source libraries and just figuring out how it works. Eventually, I wrote a whole system that can help radiologists make their decisions. All right, ready? Yeah. I'm by no means a wizard at machine learning. I'm completely self-taught. I'm in high school. I YouTubed and just found my way through it. You don't know about that kid in Brazil that might have a groundbreaking idea or that kid in Somalia. You don't know that they have these ideas, but if you can open source your tools, you can give them a little bit of hope that they can actually conquer what they're thinking of. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, he's an amazing, amazing kid. Um, but yeah, I think, <clears throat> and what an example of what's possible when, you know, you, you apply that that thing that I mentioned that humans are really great at, that emotional intelligence, those connecting of, of dots in a, <clears throat> in a not lateral, not obvious way, and then using the machine's intelligence, which is incredibly good at stuff that we are not at. And uh, yeah, when those two come together, it can be really powerful. So I'm optimistic. No, no, I mean, We're I gonna mean all fine. the projects that, that, that uh, you're involved in are, of course, um, you know, uh, um, incredibly well intended and, and uh, innovative, uh, absolutely. I mean, the problem is that we have people who also take uh, technology in their hand and take it to very dark uh, uh, sides. Uh, but I, I think it is important to remind ourselves that it can have such positive impact. I think we, we really need to um, remind ourselves uh, because it is, it is easy to only see the you know, yeah, elections being rigged, and mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, another uh, project that I, I thought was was uh, quite powerful, uh, and it, it relied less on the hardware. Is is um, the um, the story the the internet sassy? Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so, it, um, okay. So there's a a reality, a very sad reality that. Uh, there is a really, really big uh, digital gender gap in India. Um, and even though more and more people in India come online every second, the digital gender gap, especially in rural parts of the country, is actually getting wider and wider at the same time. So I think uh, in most remote parts of the country, one in 10 people who are online is a woman. So, uh, and that's, that's getting exacerbated with time. So there's a real danger that half, or actually more than half, of the population is going to end up being left behind as the rest of the country embraces what is, what is made possible um, thanks to internet access. So um, Google have an office in, in India, they have a couple, and we worked with a team there who had developed a program called the Internet Safi program. Safi means, in Hindi it means I don't think there's like a direct English word translation for it, but it means something in between like a fellow and a friend. Mm. But uh, so internet friend. And essentially um, what the program is aimed to do is, uh, I think we've lost, we've lost visual on the thing. It's fine, it doesn't matter. Um, basically what they've done is they've trained up, I think at this point, uh, 25,000 women across the country uh, given them smartphones, given them data packages, given them training, and tasked them with uh, going to neighboring villages in their area and training up other women um, about the internet and showing them how it can be useful and relevant to their lives. 
because part of, I mean, this, this gender gap thing is complicated and it has many angles to it. Um, there are kind of like practical reasons why there aren't that many women online that relate to to cost predominantly. Um, but there are also a lot of social and cultural and religious reasons why. And there's, you know, men who want to get in the way and, and prevent women from coming online, but there's also women who fundamentally just don't see the relevance of the internet for, for them in their lives. So we traveled to India, myself and a few um, other people from Creative Lab, and we spent some time traveling around the whole country, uh, documenting the program and interviewing people and kind of just figuring out, A, was it successful? Was it working as intended? Were there ways we could improve on it? Um, and you know, we met a lot of, of really amazing women, uh, these internet Southies, each of them with their own uh, their own background, their own story, their own ambition, their own motivation, their, their own reason for, for getting involved. Um, and there were wide differences across, but there was a similarity that, that sort of we noticed everywhere that we went, which was that when these women went online and they learned things about the internet and they learned things on the internet that could, could directly impact their lives, they were really happy and really eager to share that information with everybody around them. So. It was kind of having this like positive ripple effect. You got one woman online, and it was having this positive ripple effect in their communities because they were very much the heart of their homes and the nexus of their communities. So they were helping people set up businesses. They were helping educate kids. You know, they were kind of um, improving the quality of life in their communities. Um, so to tell the story of the program, we followed one internet sati in particular and and documented her day to day. Uh, so we have a short film here, which is the story of a lady named Buji, who lives in uh, Andhra Pradesh, the southeastern coast of, of India. Ma urundi patna mella lante buslo rundi gantlo parthundi. Samamara grama matto kutamamla kalsunta. Mauranta anada mulla kachilla kalsunta. School nevana. Samamul striga ei nate thene nu. Ii naal gorala madhya idha prapanche mankorni pratikutunnanu. Nechkunati Logane, Tata Trust Valu, Google Team, Magramanke, enter you coacher. At La Website Gurte, La Wapen Autodi. I put in a internet satiga, Mahilandani, Anla Lokitis Kostunano. But an internet satiga, select in the Garros in an introduction costum, Magramola, Cyclist Kunelano. Cyclist Kunel the Yenti Cyclo, Ice Cream Bandanas and Comment Chesaru. In the law, ice cream on the tabs of phones on the eye. It could a project internet soccer in Ledu. Memo work internet soccer in Kalpistuna. Evil internet lunny soccer alone. Well, tell you, Pachadella. All chairs. Good chair. In the Kante, Gramola and the not at Katad Gabati, Alakadu, Virgo Chegalta, Miko, Samar Jamundi, Putta the Dante. Okasari can come a hill of internet near Piste, while Charles to Bartar. Love's design. Internet near Chodandara, Prapancham and Mundun Tundi. What are you talking about? Yes, it's excellent. Mind blowing. Wow. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. You can't do it. Just plain. So, we can't do it. 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 So, we just monthly monthly cut and keep the every month fees of PJ Lutanamata. Okamahila Internet Nets Kodondara, 
తనకు తన చుట్టుప్రక్కల వాళ్ళకు ఎంతో ఉపయోగం మహిళ గృహ అవసరాలకు ఉపయోగపడుతుంది కొత్త వ్యవసాయ పద్ధతులు తెలుసుకునేటకు ఉపయోగపడుతుంది ఇంటర్నెట్ని మహిళలు పిల్లలకు విద్య నేర్పించుటకు పశువుల సంరక్షణకు ఉపయోగించుకుంటున్నారు అట్లా అనేసి నేర్చుకున్న ప్రతి ఒక్కరు మరొకరు మరొకరుగా చెప్తా ఉంటే అలాగా విలేజ్ బాగుపడుతుందని నా ఆలోచన నా ఆశ కూడా Fantastic. I, I loved it when she says, um, uh, you know, how do you explain to someone that the whole world is in the internet? <laughs> you know, it's just, uh, it, that's really a powerful sentence. Um, I, you know, I think this is, of course, helping people to be creative. We can, we can clearly see it. And, um, you know, looking at, again, at, at the kind of, the the rate and the pace of the spread of technology and uh, the adoption of technology um you know one of the questions that came to me uh, really looking at your work uh, was you know well how do you how do you actually nurture creativity you know not just to kind of use uh, the technology how do you nurture creativity and then i i i saw this thing a, 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 um, an interesting parallel between you know, the situation, let's say your education and kind of um, professional uh, training has been very much about going to different countries, uh, going to different institutions, you know, working with different people and what makes you uh, and uh, gives you, you know, the, the kind of the creative uh, impulse that, that uh, comes with you is has to do with having this, you know, very much the kind of the varied and different backgrounds. And uh, maybe we can now see, you know, platforms like Google very much about doing that, but at, at our doorstep, because, you know, we get connected to many places, things and people uh, just, you know, sitting here. And so we can, I think, calling it, you know, the, the creative lab, or I think Google really as, as a kind of a creative source is, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely, um, you know, right. Um, I um, was looking at, again, I, 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 I couldn't have thinking about what it means, you know, in, in the world of architecture and, um, you know, buildings, are not very good at that, haven't always been good at that, or, or we don't always thinking, think of buildings as places of also necessary learning. We, we, maybe when we go to schools, when we go, you know, but mm. uh, there, we put content inside that is about learning, but we don't think enough about buildings as places that also allow us to participate in learning. And if, for example, we look at our even buildings for learning schools and universities you know they are to this day very much about you know a room where you learn in you know a classroom and then you come out and you're not learning anymore which of course that's not the case you know we are going to be learning in the cafeteria um, and you know universities are still dividing uh, knowledge into separate faculties and each one has a different building we're not helping people cross in the way that Google allows people, places, and ideas cross. Um, so, I mean, I know that you know Google is is um, actually investing a lot in, in new you know a lot of new buildings, and so it must have been and continues to be a discussion that you have now that you have physical space. How are you now thinking through the physical environment? You know, how are you trying to perhaps um, test? the potential of Google in a physical environment. And uh, you were mentioning that you have had some, some um, thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah. Can you share some with us? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think, I think it's actually a really interesting um, counterpoint, an intersection between what, what it is that you do and, and what we do. And I think um, you're right. There's a, there's a lot you can find out and learn on the internet. 
pretty much any piece of information you want to know is out there, whether it's true or false or anywhere in between. But um, but your experiences online tend to be quite fleeting. So there's when you when you think about the element of time and how that applies to how you spend time on the internet versus how you spend time in a building or a space, it's very different. So um, you can learn a lot on the internet, but you, you certainly can't learn everything. There's you know, you, you touched on the fact that I've moved around quite a bit in my life, and I think those experiences, those physical experiences in space and time, have taught me more than I could have learned uh, if and if I read the entire internet. <laughs> um, so there's a limitation there for sure, um, and I think that's something that architecture can supplement in a way that the internet never could, which is to create spaces and allow for physical experiences in space that last over a period of time potentially. Like if you're in school, you're in school for quite a long time in one school and that environment is going to affect your learning as much as the content of the curriculum is mm. going to affect your learning for sure. And I think um, this cross-pollination, this idea of um, designing spaces to allow for an increased serendipity between different faculties is so, so, so important because I think what the internet has done, it's done a lot of positive things, but uh, some things are kind of a double-edged sword. And one is that we have access to all of this information at any one moment, which makes us potentially smarter, but equally it kind of creates a sort of levelness um, or like a sort of, I don't know, a, like a cloudiness where we're, it's difficult to, to stand out, it's difficult to elevate, it's difficult to find a way to be unique in that space. Um, and I think, really new ideas will come around from cross-pollination. I, I use that word specifically because in nature that's how it works, right? Like a, a, a new life is created because pollen was transported from this flower over here to this flower over here and suddenly something new was, was created and the same goes with ideas. I think um, a thought that happens over here that collides with a thought that happened over here is going to create something new. So if we keep those thoughts far from each other, the possibility of newness is infinitely redacted. Um, so yeah, I mean, all that to say, I think it's super important that we think about uh, learning in spaces and how we can facilitate those encounters. It's very difficult to do. It's very difficult to do well. I mean, I don't have to tell you, 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 know, you, know, you know a lot better than, than me. Uh, people tend to think of a building like it has a specific function, whether it's a house or a museum or um, a commercial space. It has like a specific function and when you start to add functions and compile them and mix them up, it can quickly just become a mess. So to do it well and have it retain an identity and retain a function is really, really difficult. I don't, um, I don't think I'm the right person to do yeah. that. <laughs> no, but it's a, it's a question. I mean, I, I, but maybe we can, um, you know, analyze. You mentioned that, you know, all your experiences of, of um, actually spending some time in different places have been uh, fundamental to, to, to your learning, uh, you know, uh, process and experience. And I, I wonder whether one can look a little bit deeper uh, at what were the really kind of powerful um, moments and and perhaps then work on those as conditions that mm -hmm. one creates my my if i look at my own um experience i think i've learned more at the kind of in, uh, more from the interstitial uh kind of spaces and experiences than necessarily the spaces that i went for mm -hmm. like you know uh, I went to America for uh, you know to have a uh, to for a graduate uh, program and uh, I think I learned more outside of my seminars and the kind of studios and um, perhaps from even the people who were not really teaching me uh, than than the spaces that were clearly for instruction mm -hmm. uh, and. I think this is what I was mentioning a little bit earlier that actually, um, you know, informal learning, you know, we know now that informal learning is very much part of, um, you know, um, it, it can, can lead to a lot of creativity. Yeah. Um, I'm making mistakes, 
maybe. Uh, you know, that's something that there could be accidents, you know, you're searching through Google, but I tend myself more and more, I don't, maybe it's because I'm, you know, found myself in a kind of a, a busy moment of my life and I don't just sit behind the computer and just surf. Uh, I'm always looking for something. So mm -hmm. the possibility of me coming across things accidentally is less. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if spaces and buildings and their content are made where they, are, they allow for the possibility of serendipity, you know, um, unexpected encounters, uh, even people making mistakes. You know, you know, we spend too long kind of clarifying exactly where people are going, but the cities we love are not those. Uh, you know, uh, the areas of cities that we like to meander and to explore, explore. So mm -hmm. if we think of exploring on the internet and exploring a city, we like to, we, we associate the word explore with those kinds of, those, those areas of a city that, are, that don't have that kind of clarity mm -hmm. in front of us. And, and so I think it's, pos it's possible if we, uh, the, the problem with the, the word of the physical is that, uh, you know, th there is, we yet, we are yet missing, um, you know, a client like Google. Uh, of course, Google has commissioned a, a few architects, but of course, that's just a, a, a very few architects who, who really want to look at buildings as a source of creativity. You know, it's usually, for the more basic, let's say, uh, needs which they need to have. Mm. But I think that, that this is, for me, this is what distinguishes architecture from building, from mere building. Um, so maybe we can now go to, you know, move on from the issue of creativity to a little bit about the gender. And, um, um, you know, one of the things that you uh, mentioned to me was that um, you know, the possibility of disagreement uh, as a source of creativity. And uh, perhaps we could also see, you know, uh, even the disequilibrium between men and women that we, of course, are all very conscious of uh, in different fields. Um, yes, we need to continue to uh, treat men and women equal. But do you, do you think it's necessary that there is equil equilibrium in society? Is that the way we are going to create, to, to, to use perhaps the issue of gender, the fact that we have different sexes as a source of creativity? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, so I, first of all, I think if, if everything was in perfect harmony all the time between all creatures and species and people, would be a very boring world to, yeah. to live in. So for sure, uh, tension can be positive. For sure, tension, good things can come out of conflict or um, things just being uneven or, yeah, I think it, it's, it's, that's the kind of thing that like lights a fire that, that sparks a desire in you or an energy in you to like push and create or convince or change something. And that's when human beings on a, on a creative level are at, at their best. I think that's when we're creating our best work. On the other hand, the the kind of um, on a very practical contemporary level, the like gender disbalance in uh, well a lot of industries, certainly my industry, creativity, but also technology. So it's like two two things compounded on top of each other is uh, really problematic. Um, I mean, it's it's obvious to say that it's problematic, but it's it's something that. Neg if it, speaking specifically how it affects creativity, it's effect affecting it negatively, 100%. I have zero doubt in my mind. And it comes back to this idea of um, the more variety you have intersecting with one another, the better likelihood you have of creating something new and original. And when you, know, you enter a room and out of 50 people there's one woman, that's a problem. Um, so that's not a good kind of dis disequilibrium. That's a bad kind where we're sort of uh, negating the possibility of like a lot of potential um, ideas. On the other hand, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> On the other hand, that there is definitely uh, tension can be a good thing. And I think um, when you get a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds in a room, it can be it can be a little bit more difficult to get to a good creative output initially because we don't have we don't necessarily speak a common language. 
So if I, I have quite a common language, like a shorthand with the people that I've been working with for a while now, which means that it's very easy for us to make work quickly. That doesn't necessarily mean we're making the best work because we're kind of defaulting to things that we agree on already. So that tension when you don't speak the same language, sometimes literally, um, forces you to come at things from a different perspective. And I think uh, is, we have a much greater likelihood of coming up with good ideas, new ideas, um, by forcing ourselves to to battle a little bit. And I think it actually relates a bit to what you were touching on with, with, with buildings. Like, I think when you choose, or even surfing online, when you search and you choose to, to look after a particular answer and you find it, you've gotten your piece of information and then you move on. But when you're browsing or meandering in a space and you're encountering things by chance, like those are moments of delight. And I think those moments of delight don't happen when you're in a known space, in a known environment, talking to, to people who think and, and behave like you. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it, you know, it, it, is a, it, is a, it is a dilemma, because, I, uh, you know, for creativity, um, we need diversity. Um, and uh, yet, very often, very often, uh, gender discussions tend to move towards, uh, you know, creating some kind of homophony between men and women, uh, which is not about diversity. Um, uh, you know, it's not. And uh, we also have this situation where, because, of course, we need to celebrate uh, the work of men and women, um, and because perhaps men have had a lot, they've been more celebrated, we need to celebrate women now. Um, and the, the danger, I think, is when, um, uh, you know, the celebration is understood as creating some kind of role model that other women should emulate. Uh, and how to, how, to, how to avoid that? You know, how do we, how do we celebrate uh, the work of women and make sure that we also, also nurture further uniqueness, further diversity, um, you know, for, and, and give confidence for, you know, other women to go and do it their way, rather than trying to create some kind of, uh, you know, uh, another kind of equality. Uh, how do you think we can do that? How can we nurture um, that? And, 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 you know, whether it's prizes or articles on successful women, how, how, can, we, how can we not turn them into role models that are understood as, you know, men have these role models that they kind of, you know, there is a way to be a kind of a successful man. Well, the great thing about not having role models for women is that we don't have anybody to emulate. I mean, that's our strength. We can walk into a meeting room, you know, I can walk into a meeting room and yes, I'm most of the times one of the few, if not the only woman, but then I can behave the way I want. And I think that's my, my strength, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, to be creative with the meeting. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so, I mean, how do we, how do we, how do, and I, you know, how do we actually, and this is not just for women, it's for men and women alike, how do we make sure that we nurture diversity rather than turn this, um, I think this um, celebration of good work into, into reducing it? Yeah, I think um, we're particularly now at a difficult moment with regards to that. I think there's um, visibility is one thing and role models is another thing. And I think um, visibility is something that I really believe like we need to get better at, like sh shining a light on women who are doing really interesting, great, interesting work. Like, where are they? They're, they're out there doing them, but you never see them in mainstream, in media, you know. I, it just it's it's really upsetting and i think the, the the list the less you see them the less the sort of younger generation are likely to believe that they can be that when they're kind of coming up and, and rising through the ranks so visibility is really important on the other hand role models and i, I fully agree role models is a little bit trickier i think because there are so f there's such little female visibility especially um sort of at senior level senior positions you instantly become a role model whether you like it or not you have that label on you um and that's, I think, partially because we are few. There's not a lot of people like in, in the limelight, so to speak. Uh, and role models is not necessarily productive because a role model, I think role models are really important, but 
I think it's a very personal decision. No one should be given that label mm. by an authority. You know, it, like I could choose a role model, you could choose a role model, men should have role models, and they do. And I think that can be a really um, useful thing. But it's something you, you choose for yourself, and it's depending on what's important to you and what you want to achieve rather than, well, there's this one person, so I guess that's who I have to be, and therefore you begin to adapt your behavior and emulate because you think that's what you need to do to be successful. Um, so I think we have to push through, we're in this moment in time right now where there's not enough visibility of creative women who are doing great work. Once there is a mass, I hope this role model situation will kind of just be what it is for men, which is they can pick and choose their role models at any level of their career um, based on what's important to them, you know, actual criteria that's important to them on a personal level as opposed to, uh, yeah what they think they have to be. Um, I don't feel that bad for, for men, even though they might feel like they need to, <laughs> they need to wear a tie to be successful. They still have more choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah.